Okay, everybody. Um, some of you I've met, I think, at the last meeting. I'm Steve Lockley. Um, as it says on there, I'm a chair of building modelling, actually, in, uh, in Northumbria. And it is the first time I've met most of you, I think. I don't think I've met this gentleman before. Uh, were you at the talk that was given by Alan White? Waha? No, I'm, I'm a part-time student. Part-time so student. Uh, so I think most of you have had like 10 or 12 weeks of um, various guest speakers. So I'm actually a guest speaker, but I'm coming in on a regular slot because uh, I, I get too tired after five o'clock. <laughs> I'm sure you do. So, um, and I think I'm the last one in the series, Dave, is that right? Yes, correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it was a bit difficult. I sent an email out to you to uh, ask if any of you had any specific things you wanted to cover. And I'm very happy towards the back end of this to go and deal with specific questions you may have and issues that you'd like to just talk about a bit more. I did get some uh, response from some of the distance learning students and I've put some information in there that I hopefully will address those questions but also be useful and relevant to you guys. So, I'll skip that. What I'm going to talk about is really, I, I suspect everything that you've been made aware of so far about BIM has been about the processes of creating models for construction projects. It's been, if you like, the traditional job of the architect or the engineer or, you know, it's always come from that perspective because that is the way mostly BIM is presented to us all at the moment. But in reality, um, that isn't why in this country we're all doing BIM. It actually isn't anything to do with the drivers behind why we're doing BIM. Because if it was, our government would just leave it to the software vendors. Because as far as they're concerned, it's just a commercial thing that they do. And if it's any good, we'll do it. If it's not, it'll fail. But our government isn't leaving it to software vendors. It's actually actively intervening in the marketplace, which is really unusual in the UK. It doesn't happen very often. And it's almost against our culture in some ways to do that. But the government is not acting in the marketplace as a legislative body or a statutory body. It's acting as somebody who pays for 40 plus percent of the buildings that get put up in this country. And it's fed up with the construction industry. Really fed up. And they've done studies and found out that construction in the UK is something like 30 percent more expensive than other parts of Europe and in Ireland. And there is no reason for it. So, you know, not to be too beating about the bush, um, their perception is that the industry is either massively inefficient or it's taking the liberty and stealing money from the government. So they want to stop that. And you will have seen, I'm sure, other lectures that have showed you what the government wants to do now. So what I would like to do in this one is... Um, Take the viewpoint of the government as a client who commissions buildings and explain to you what they have now put down in various um, semi-legal documents, how they expect us to work as consultants for them as clients. So my viewpoint is, I, I am an architect by the way, so I, I'm quite happy to look at it as an architect. But the viewpoint I'm going to take for this talk is the viewpoint of um, a client in the government. Somebody who wants a building put up by our government, looking at you as the industry and expecting you to give me a better service than you are at the moment. And I hope for all of you this will be relevant because I'm assuming the main reason you're here is because you want to move on in your professions and your careers. And to do that, you have to be delivering things to the customer and the client better than your competitors. That will make you better than them in the marketplace. So what I hope this will do is give you some insights into how you're expected to do that in the UK. <clears throat> and the same methodology is being promoted and adopted in other parts of the world like Singapore, um, Australia, most America, most of them are adopting a similar approach to this way of thinking about things. In fact, the Americans led it out. So this picture was put up on most of the government websites. This is our Minister for Frightening People, I don't, <laughs> Francis Ward. Um, I think this was probably in 2011, this went up on the websites. 
And the mission statement here was that the government has a four-year strategy for BIM implementation that will change the dynamics and behaviour of the construction supply chain. Supply chain to them is you. It's people who deliver buildings to them. Okay. Unlocking new, more efficient and collaborative ways of working, this whole sector adoption of BIM will put us at the vanguard of a new digital construction era and position the UK to become the world leaders in BIM. Basically, five years ago, no one even knew what BIM was. So being a world leader in BIM was quite a claim, because, hey, no one really knew what it was anyway. But that's what they said they were going to do. And to a large extent, I hope I'll show you that's what they've done. And they, in, in that journey, they've put out a series of publications over time. And, and this is a particularly significant line. The government, as a client, can derive significant improvements in cost, value, and carbon performance through the use of open, shareable asset information. And these are not just words, okay? When I saw these four years ago, I just thought, oh, yeah, blah, blah. It's just words, okay? But it's not. And what I was trying to show you is how they have very specifically delivered these targets. And when I say delivered, as of last week. So two weeks ago, this, this all went out into the industry. So you're, you're really at a very current time now for this. So in April, this was launched to the UK construction industry as something that the government as a client is demanding. There's no option. You know, if you want to work for them, you've got to do what I'm going to tell you in the next hour. Well, that's not good. Any idea what that means, folks? Okay, can't use the mouse, that's what it means. <laughs> so <coughs> so in, in, in those two statements that you saw, there were three things that we need to, well, ignore and unpack. So as far as I'm concerned, efficient and collaborative ways of working is just a target. It doesn't mean much. No one's actually come up with a method of measuring any of this stuff. In the five years they've been doing it, the evidence is tentative that it's actually more efficient. It's just really a goal. Improvements in cost, value and carbon performance. Again, there isn't much evidence that BIM is delivering these things, although nobody would ever admit that. But if you go and look for real tangible evidence and say, show me how you've done that, they won't find anything. It's a bit similar to saying to people, CAD has revolutionised the construction industry and saved us millions of pounds as an industry. Prove it. You can't. Okay? Everyone's moved on, everyone's doing different things, there's no benchmarking data, nobody really knows uh, whether we're better or worse. Perceptually, people think they're better, and that's all you can expect. So what you'll tend to see is people who have adopted BIM don't go back. I, I see you writing, which is great, but most people now don't go back to writing for anything. They will use a word processor, and you'll use a word processor, it's just more convenient here. And, and it's the same with BIM. People still drawing, still doing things, but they don't go back once they've adopted BIM. There's absolutely no evidence of that out there. And the last one is the one I want to concentrate on because that is actually a deliverable. That statement is something they're asking us as a sector, as an industry, to deliver, which is open, shareable asset information. Anybody any ideas what that is? What does it mean to you? Does it mean anything to you? <laughs> Not really, but when you strip it back, it does have some meaning. Um, essentially, they want people to be able to collaborate easier, um, efficiently and effectively, which is part of the main driver of BIM. Okay, That's, I'm really glad you said that, Alex, because that is the common perception that people have. And I actually don't think that is their view. And I hope we can have that discussion as we go through this. Okay, because again, what the view you took there, quite rightly, was the view of the supply chain, the consultants, and for them collaborating and working together. Yeah. The government, as a client, isn't interested in what we do. It's not bothered. It's, it's our business. And in terms of their costs of running buildings, that little bit of procurement of creating the building is very small cost significance to them. They're not yeah. bothered. What they're bothered about is the cost they leave us with afterwards. And that's where they're focusing their efforts. So I'll come on to that. So open and shareable, there's actually a definition. You have these slides so you can look it up. But it actually means, as you quite rightly said, 
the ability to interoperate or intermix different data sets. So that's a technical definition that's accepted. So it doesn't mean, um, uh, it isn't really about collaboration and communication, it's about I've got two data sets, I need to bring them together to do something new with it. So if you were in GIS and you've got weather data and you've got data about people going to shops and you can see that when it's raining, people don't go to shops. This is the kind of thing the government wants to be able to do with its buildings. It wants to look at the data and find uh, causality, things that are causing problems or things they could do better in their data. So that's their driver. It isn't, it isn't about how we create that building. It's about what happens afterwards with the data. An asset is something that has an economic value. So, you know, it isn't necessarily a chair, but it might be a lecture theatre. Okay? So a lecture theatre has an economic value in that there's a revenue generated by the fact that you can come here and get taught, and if that is not possible, then we lose the ability to create revenue from this thing. So assets are a very important thing to hang your head on. A lot of people kind of think assets are just stuff that's around the place, but they have to be things that have an economic value to the business who's got them, who owns them. In other words, they have to have an interest in making sure that they get value from their assets. Chair can sit there forever and do nothing, nobody cares. It's only when it's worn out or broken or someone gets hurt or falls off it that people care because then the value thing comes in and they get actions against them. Um, and the information here that we're asked to supply is information necessary to support management of an asset so that it will provide future benefit. So it's not all information. A lot of people think that asset information is just everything I know about this chair. It's black and speckly, it's got foam in it and all that. No, it's just the information that says that chair is safe for another three years and it sits one medium-sized person. If they're more than 30 stone, it'll probably break. That's the kind of thing they're interested in. And here we have a problem because, in my view at the moment, what they're asking for is impossible for the industry to deliver. So the industry at the moment just is incapable of doing this. It doesn't understand it at all. It, so we have a situation where the client is saying, I want this stuff. And the industry doesn't know how to get it together, to get it out to them. And they're all, at the moment, as the bottom slide shows, they're all just pointing at each other and saying it's somebody else's responsibility. You know, so when I put a boiler in a building, to heat my building, who's responsible for giving me the asset data about the boiler? Is it the manufacturer who made it? Is it the subcontractor who installed it? Is it the main contractor who employed the subcontractor? Is it the architect who specified it? We don't know. So we, have, we don't have any conventions in the industry to deal with this problem. So we're making them up at the moment, which is great for you lot because, you know, if you can understand this, this is a service you can deliver to people. And you've all seen this. I only put this up. I hate this picture. I really hate it because it's, in my opinion, it's completely caused more problems than it's solved. Okay? But this was in 2011. This was done by Mervyn, and Richard, uh, Mervyn Richards and Mark Bew. Um, and, and now we are actually on that red line. So they put that red line there in 2011. And as of today, that's where we stand. And according to this, we've mastered... 3D CAD, no problem. We've mastered asset information models, no problem. Facilities information models, no problem. Building services information models, no problem. Not at all, okay? Not at all are we there. We've got all these things like collaboration portals, file-based collaboration. I, I know of two portals that are starting to be collaboration portals. They're not there, okay? So although we're supposed to be here, in reality, we're probably somewhere here. And I'll talk a little bit at the end about what's in three and four as we go through. But most of this stuff, what they have delivered is what they could deliver. So they've delivered the documents, BS, uh, PAS 1192s and the standards. They've delivered good guidance to the industry. You know, in fairness to the BIM task group, they've done a cracking job of getting things in place for us. But picking up that ball by the industry is still taking a long time. 
So then what they did was they decided to have a series of pilot projects to test it. So over the last three or four years, this is one of the most uh, commonly known ones called Cook and Wood. Uh, and they started with the Ministry of Justice to see, um, you know, it was a genuine attempt to really see if they could do what they want. This is still ongoing, okay, as of today. Um, along the top here, this is, if you like, a flowchart. It's a, it's, we call them swim lane diagrams. And this just gives you an idea of how complex the thinking is behind the information exchanges that are going off in these projects. This is not something Joe Soap in the construction industry can do. This is a very specialist skill set along the top here. And they're asking people to do that as routine on government work. Surprise, surprise, they're struggling to find people who can do it. This stuff everybody gets, you know? These nice 3D models with all the bits in. So what they did here was they created a standard cell for prisoners, all fully specified, great idea. But we've been doing that for years. I mean, that's not new. The only difference is it's in 3D. Um, and then they did the whole prison, built it all up, and they looked at the benefits. <clears throat> You'll struggle to find anything that says what the benefits were. I got these from somewhere I probably shouldn't have. Okay, I haven't seen them public. What I can tell you about these two is, these are what the client said, which was important to them. And the client said, for the first time I could understand the building design, it allowed me to contribute and comment, both positively and negatively, for the first time rather than having to look at a flat drawing. So, okay, that's great. The client was happy. This client said a similar thing. The savings on this were put down to the fact that they had a, two parts of the cell with the prison with different levels of security, high security, medium security. And in between, traditionally, they had a steel wall because you didn't want high security people breaking through into lower security areas. And this steel wall cost a lot of money. Not that much, but a lot of money. And this lady here, when she saw it, she didn't see a steel wall. She saw two guards on each side of that steel wall protecting those areas. And she just asked the question and said, well, that guard cost me £60,000 a year. And I've got to have two because you put a steel wall there. Why don't you put a glass wall there that's bullet grass that they can see through? And then they only have to have one guard protecting this area. That's going to save me £60,000 a year on my wage bills alone. So it wasn't anything to do with the construction of the property as such. That didn't save very much money going from steel to bulletproof glass. But what it was was that you've now got people who have got big costs of running a prison, so you take £60,000 over 25 years, all of a sudden they can say, we've saved one and a half million, or whatever. Okay? And this is the kind of thinking you've got to get into your head with this. This is the source of savings you'll get for your client if you can advise them properly. So they went on this strategy, and you may or may not see this diagram lying around, but essentially, they created, and there's about eight different versions of these green blobs. These are, if you like, stages in the process, and I'll come on to that later. And on this side, you've got the supply chain who are delivering things in. So you've got your main contractor, your architect, your engineers, your subcontractors. And on this side, you've got your client. And the basic premise that the government has is that if you can make this communication all the way through, everybody will save money. So if we can get these data exchanges and communication all the way through the process, it's a win-win situation from everyone. However, you try and prove that that money's saved, that's going to be really difficult. And in fact, I know of architects' practices who have said to me, we don't want our clients to know we're using BIM because they'll assume we can reduce the fee. Okay? That's definitely been said to me on more than one occasion. Now think about that for a so that, you know, how are you going to get this saving coming up if everyone's thinking, oh, I've made a saving, I'll keep it for myself, which is commercial human nature, unfortunately. So what the government did was it created a whole raft of these standards, which you'll have no doubt come across, uh, telling people how to do things, helping them out. It created some legal things that gave... Um, some changes to the existing normal contracts that we work under to allow 
more collaboration and more exchange of data um, without necessarily passing on all of the liability and things like that to other people. And um, it created the BIM Toolkit, which I think has Stephen Hamill presented that to you. So you see that so the BIM Toolkit went live two weeks ago properly, and that is now the preferred platform for you to plan your construction projects out. So that's where we are. Okay. Anybody got any questions before I go into where it's going and how you're going to work with this? You all okay? Okay. So, now we go into what I call acronym soup. Because as soon as you go off the board of that top level helicopter view, you end up with a whole pile of three letter acronyms for stuff. And you just get bombarded by them. But some of them, and it seems to me like, they just seem, you know, if they can't make it a three letter acronym, they can't have it. It's, it's sometimes a bit crazy. So this is the big plan for what the client wants from us. Okay? Now, what you've probably been dealing with mostly is this stuff at the bottom here. The project information model, the employer's information requirements. But that's actually got a lot of other things done before this can happen. So at the top here, we've got the organisational information requirements. So every client, not just government clients, are being strongly suggested to, or in the case of government clients, told to create organisational information requirements for their unit. So it's OIR. Okay? And then from that, they're supposed to develop an asset information requirement, which produces the guidance for the asset information model, and then you come down to the construction team. And I'll go through these in more detail. The problem is that we've all focused on those two things. And so has the BIM Task Force and other people, BIM Task Group. And, and in a way, it's a bit the wrong way around. Okay? So, you know, you never want your horse behind you if you've got a cart. It's not good. Okay? But that's what's happened. We have a situation where this stuff can't really fly until this stuff is normal practice. And this stuff only really started a year ago, probably six months ago. So we've been all been being told as an industry we've got to do this for the last five to ten years, and yet this stuff, which is the sort of go-no-go -no -go switch for it, is only just starting. And there's some real problems with that, which I'll come on to. So, what is an organisational information requirement? It's data and information required to achieve the client's objectives. So the word you hang on to there is client's objectives. So what is this client trying to achieve from the things that you're providing for them? I gave the example of this as a lecture theatre. It's pretty clear that my requirement is that I can make this dark so that I can have projection, that I can have 40 students in here, um, and that I can operate it as a lecture theatre safely. There are a set of obvious things that would be a requirement from any client. 99 times out of 100, architects never engage the client in that discussion. They'll presumably go and just come up with a drawing and some models and go, here we are, here we are, as a lecture theatre. They don't ask the client how they run their business. So here's the first thing that you have to do, is find out the client's expectations for running what you're handing over as a business. Not as a physical building, as a business. And it's the client's responsibility to give them to you. Now that's the first problem. They haven't really picked this ball up either. So clients haven't really worked out how to do that yet. They're struggling. Because it's a whole new mindset for them. They've never had to think about, you know, I own this asset. Does it actually make me any money? You would probably, if any of you are local, you'll know that local government is being told, if you've got buildings that you're not making any money out of, give them away. Sell them. Do whatever. You know, but don't just sit on them anymore. So it's not an asset just because it's sitting there doing nothing. It's an asset if it's making you revenue. <clears throat> Most likely consultants are being asked to do that. So here's a potential job for you. Yeah. If you can go to clients and advise them on how to draw up their information requirements for their organisation, it's a service. And, and that's being taken up now by some of the big project management companies and consultants. Um, 
the big thing is, if you don't understand these from the outset, you're on the wrong foot. You're not off to a good start. And the other thing is that this information, this organisational stuff, has to be broken down into decision points in the delivery of a project. So if, if, it, if they're going to do a project, you have to understand their requirements at each stages of the project for their business. Because it could be a decision like, I need to raise money, I need to borrow something, I need to close down that facility, I need to move those people to somewhere else. These are organisational requirements. Okay? And we don't do that. It's very rare that happens as, at the outset of a job. Uh, <clears throat> they lead to asset information requirements. So now we've moved from focusing on the organisation to focusing on the asset that we're delivering to them. Um, it, it, this really is a translation of their organisational requirements into things about the assets. So it would be Maybe, for instance, in here, it would be information about the kinds of digital projection they want, the kinds of computing and networking they want, the things that are tangible physical assets but meet some organisational need. So you've got to think, think of the building in those terms. Um, <clears throat> and, the, and under the government's new way of working, these are going to be specified as part of your contract. So you're going to get given these as a contractual requirement to deliver. Which means, if you don't do it with them, you're a breach of your contract. Okay? And the big thing of all, this silly little thing here, is causing more trouble than everything. It's a requirement for an asset information requirement that you, the client tells you how to classify the information. So, if you're um, a railway provider and you're getting a station, Stations have their own way, railway providers have their own system of tagging things. They know what a, what it, a Kobo and a Bobo and a... They've got all these names for things that everyone knows, which is classification. Things that to you and I would mean nothing, um, but to them are absolutely important. So you have, to, you have to understand the language of your client from the outset of the job. Again, something we don't do. And they're asking you to give the information back to them in their language, not in ours. Something we don't do. We just give them a big DVD full of drawings. <clears throat> the reason for this is obviously because at the end of it all, whatever information you give them back, they need to search and retrieve things, they need to understand it. They don't want to waste time working out what you've called uh, an overhead power cable. You might call it line or something. That, that ambiguity is where we have real problems, and so that's the, it's a really big thing, but it's a simple thing to say. So here's an example from the Ministry of Justice. This, two weeks old, uh, you can see it's still draft, they're still trying to work out how to do it. But this is the Ministry of Justice for the UK Government, asset information requirements for uh, most of their estate. So. They're not doing it for a building, this, that's too ridiculous for them. They're doing it for an entire state of buildings. And you can't read this, but I'll, I'll show you in a minute. But essentially what you've got in these columns is some category of thing. That's it. Some category of thing, um, a description of it, and then this is the meaty bit here. Okay? And this entire asset information requirement list for all Ministry of Justice buildings is one page, okay? So there are probably 45 things on it that you've got to deliver. So they're not asking for the moon on a stick, you know, it's, it's quite doable. And they're being very clear about what they want. So you can see here, this is a zoom of that corner, and these are the main components that we're being asked to deliver as an industry to the client. So the first one is Kobe. Hands up who hasn't heard of Kobe. I knew I wouldn't get a response from you. You know what Kobe is, do you? Yeah. Okay. So they're saying, do we require Kobe? But they're not just saying, which some stupid jobs are doing at the moment, on this job I require Kobe, which is just stupid, okay? What they're saying is, I don't want any Kobe for the substructure, I'm not interested, don't want it for the frame, don't want any of these things, but I do want for the upper floors, I want Kobe. I want it for stairs and ramps, and I want it for walls. So they're being specific about what they want information 
from you. Uh, and they understand why they want that, because at the end of the day, they're paying for you to give them this information. So they don't want just you to give them tons of information. They want you to give them information that helps them manage their assets. And then here, you've got this thing here, max LOI, and then you've got LOD, see, more TLAs, three letter acronyms. <laughs> There's loads of these. And then we've got a four letter acronym, that's because it's a quantity surveyor, NRM1. <laughs> Obviously, much better value. So, what are all these things? Okay, you can see that LOD is broken down by by role. So they're asking for different levels of D, which I'll come on to, in for different people at different stages. Okay, so it's quite a bit of thought gone into this. So, what does it mean by Kobe required? That's that multicolored spreadsheet that's all horribly purple and yellow and has never been anywhere near an architect or a designer in his life. It's been done by somebody who's colorblind, in fact. Fact. <laughs> but, uh, so we'll come on to that. They want that. That's what it means. What does max LOI mean? LOI is level of information. So essentially, the best way to think about this is it's properties of an asset that they want. So for every different kind of asset, they will want certain properties. So if it's a boiler, they might want the heat output. If it's a chair, they might want the shape. Um, they might want the manufacturer. They might want to know the colour of the material. So they're very, very specific to the thing that you're dealing with. <clears throat> and they have this concept of max LOI, which is really interesting. LOD. Well, it's either level of development or level of detail. So it's saying to you, I want you to develop this object to this level. So I'll, I'll give you some examples in a minute, but it might be, you know, just give me a rough idea. Or it might be, I want to know every nut and bolt and connection on this thing. That's what level of development is or level of detail. And then NRM1, NRM2, NRM3, NRM4, is, is the Royal Institute of Charter Surveyors method of measurement. It's a classification system, okay? It is not the one that the government wanted everyone to use, but there's a war on between all the professional bodies, and they're fighting to get their classification systems into things. The reason this is important for your perspective, particularly in the UK, but it, it's the same in any other country, um, is that this particular NRM1 is used for working out the cost of things. Like, what is the average cost of chairs in a lecture theatre? What's the average cost of carpeting? What's the average cost of ceiling tiles? So that when you're making a plan of how you're going to spend your money and invest in your property, you've got some kind of idea what the average costs are. Okay? So basically, behind these categories, there's a whole pile of historical data that the quantity surveyors just keep adding 5% on and charging you more for everything. Okay? That's by and large being a bit facetious, but quite often it works that way. So they have a historical data set that they've acquired over 40 odd years of calculating the cost of things in buildings so that they can estimate what a new thing would cost. Okay? So it's important to have this for a client because if they want to value their, the asset you delivered them against the asset you delivered them five years ago, They've got to have standard ways of, of structuring that information. So the client here is saying, I don't want the new government fandangled way because I've got no data about that, even though I'm the government. <coughs> I want it in noodles and measurement. And you have to comply with that in anything you give to them. It's a classification system. The one thing that I did mention before was information is specific to each of the stages as you go through the project. And you'll notice there wasn't any information on there about the stages. It didn't say, at stage one, I want this, at stage two, I want that. It didn't do that. It just said, I want max LOI three or four. Cleverly, what they've done, cleverly or unintentionally, I'm not sure, what they've done is they've aligned these levels of information with the actual stages of a project. So LOI three is a definition of an amount of information to have for an object. But it's also stage three of the project, so it's probably detailed design, okay? And, and LOI, LOI 6 is construction, or handover, and LOI 7 is operation and maintenance. So by saying max three, they've kind of said, I don't want any more information than you would give me at detailed design stage. Not interested, which is interesting. 
well, it is if you're a geek and you're into this stuff. Um, so this is the Kobe stuff that they're asking for. And Kobe is, at one level, simplistic, but another level, really challenging. And what I'm going to do is take you through, I'm going to actually try and walk you through doing the whole of this process from beginning to end, really, on a, on a building, live. And you'll see that this is really, really difficult to do. Okay? This, this is a great source of revenue for people. Um, but at one level, Kobe is just, give me your drawings. It doesn't ask for a 3D model. It just says, give me drawings, plans, schedules, anything you've always given me. But I want my data in this multicolored spreadsheet. And that previous thing I showed you, the asset information requirement, tells me what data I've got to put in here. Simple as that. So for instance, at LOI 1, it might say, I just want to know the spaces, and I want to know how big they are. That's not an unreasonable request from a client who's trying to provide a facility like a university campus. You do need to know how big your lecture theatres are, how big your conference rooms are, and all of those things. Okay? So they just that's it. It's, it's not any more complicated than that. In order to do that, they're asking you to provide the following bit of information. So they want the facility, the floors, the spaces, and the zones. How many of you have done a real job? Have you ever handed over any information that told people how the zoning of the building worked? No. So a simple thing like that, which actually we all do. We all do zoning. You know, you, th you think um, there's a circulation zone, there's a quiet zone. We all do it, but we never actually formalise it or hand it over to anybody. So all this does is say, you need to do that. You need to tell me formally what these things are so that I know, because I've got to operate them and maintain them. And it has some other information about contacts, okay? And then as we move through, I'll go a bit quicker, we get to outline solutions, so here's that prison cell, and in here, you might just want to know that there's sinks and desks and toilets and things in there. And, and how does it look? Is it going to work? Am I happy? And so we now have in here types, components, and systems. So I've probably got a heating system, a ventilating system, I've got chairs, desks, toilets, wash and basins, and I know what type they are, so it will be, you know, um, a back mounted toilet um, and it will be a um, variable volume air conditioning system, it's that kind of thing. And then we get through to construction information and you can see here, here you now you're actually instructing people to build this so you've got to be pretty specific about stuff. So we have some other things coming here from the client's perspective is they want to know where things are how big they are, the size of them, and they want any documents that they might need about them to maintain them. So that's all those other red things are here. Again, not unreasonable. I don't be, sometimes I can't use the mouse, I don't know why. So here it is all out in one go. So this is, the purple stuff has come from the MVS Bib Toolkit. This is for a boiler. In a, in a facility, and one, two, six, seven are just randomly chosen for four stages of the construction process. Uh, this is the level of detail they're asking for, and the way they communicate that is graphically. So when you want to work out how much detail they show you, yeah, you look at the picture, and that's how you work out. It's, not, not, it's not, nothing more technical than that. You just look at the diagram, and then underneath here is the level of information they want for each of those things. So what you can see is in stage one, outline, they really just need to know the boiler's shape and any kind of access zone around it so that people can get in and maintain it. That's really important in the early stages. And there's a, a flue diameter here because loads of people are going to want to know how big that flue is coming through the building at the end. So a lot of thought gone into this. This is not just random stuff. And you can access all this at that address on there. As we move on to the next stage, you can see we have some additional information about connections, ports to the boiler, because people need to know how things wire up at that stage. But the level of information for these two is no more than a description. You know, it might just say liquid gas boiler or you know, whatever. It, it's, it's just a textual description. As we get towards the end, so six is uh, construction, seven is handover, sorry, 
six is handover and seven is operation and maintenance. Then you see we get very different things. This list actually goes on right the way to the floor when you look at it. These are the properties that they think you need to give someone when you hand over a boiler at construction. So you want to know the operating pressure, the nitrous oxygen emissions, its thermal performance, seasonal efficiency. If you don't have those things, you can't check that it's working, you can't balance it, you can't commission it, etc. Yeah? Presumably these issues will improve the, as the things like the tool can develop. Yes. Um, so once you start getting manufacturers in the practice of developing their own BIM models for the design process, or um, they will already include that information? What's happening now is manufacturers are seeing this as a marketing opportunity. Yeah. So if they can produce BIM models of their components, hey, they can get them into your job. Yeah. So in order to make you think that they're doing that really well, they're giving you extremely detailed 3D objects, beautifully real quality, with every single bit of data they can think of giving you. Probably three quarters of it is overload and you don't need it. And actually will cost you in the project. It'll yeah. slow, your, slow your computers down, it's more data to handle that you don't need. If you've got data that you don't need and it goes out of date, then it's more dangerous than not having it in the first place. Yeah. So th that's where we are at the moment. Yeah, because that was the point that I was going to get to. Like, where do you stop? Because <laughs> well, it would be too easy to give out for a boiler, for example. Everything. Everything. Yeah, and and the, the point about it is that although that's everything, it's everything for everyone. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, 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 um, the mechanical ventilating consultant needs some properties. The commissioning person needs some yeah. different properties. The quantity surveyor needs others. And it, it's endless. So this is a very long list. But then you notice when we go to operational maintenance, all of a sudden, these all become standard. So all this detail disappears, right? We go back to a level of definition that was pretty similar to the original. So when I hand it over to the client, they don't need this detailed thing from the... They don't care. They've got the boiler. They've <laughs> got the real thing. So this goes simple. All they need to know is the access zones. And here you've got replacement cost, warranty period, how long is it going to last for, uh, who is the warrantor to go to when it breaks down. So now you can see this is what the client cares about as an owner of that asset. They don't care about NOx emissions. You know, that's your job. So again, when you're dealing with this stuff, you've got to understand who it's for and what its value is when you supply it to people. Don't just think, I'll give them everything, they'll be happy, which most people are doing at the moment. I mean, you know, I've heard BIM managers in companies go, oh, we've got fantastic BIM libraries. We just hand them a lot, they've got everything. It's like just saying, here's 40 tons of lead, please carry it around with you for the next 10 years. It's not valuable to you. It's just an overhead. This is the big one. <laughs> it is the elephant in the room, and um, it's causing a lot of problems at the moment. So, a lot of people are thinking of classification as the way they structure their information. And you're getting, as I mentioned earlier, classification wars. You're getting disciplines with specific interests wanting to force other disciplines to use their classification systems. So you've got the RICS forcing RIBA to use NRM, you've got the RIBA trying to force RICS to use Uniclass, and you've got SIBZ wanting to use their systems. So all these people are wanting to use different systems of classification. And actually it's irrelevant, because that's about the project, okay? And basically, you can do what you want in a project, so fight it out amongst yourselves. No one cares, okay? What we care about is what the client's asked us for. They're going to ask you, they're going to tell you what they want, do what you want in your project, but make sure you hand over what they've asked you for, because they're paying at the end of the day. And most clients are asking for bespoke classification systems that they've invented themselves. And you've got to live with that. Okay? So if I go to, uh, you know, if I go to Network Rail, Network Rail have developed their system of organising information over 150 years. I've got to use it. I can't just say just change all of your information about railways because I'm going to use this new one here. Okay, so you've got to use it. It's for the client, it's for communicating to the client, it's for handing over the asset information model to the client, 
nothing to do with the project and it's not for costing or reporting. Don't get confused. It's for the client to manage the asset when you've lost all interest in that job. Save effort on your jobs. Just accept that you're going to have loads of classification systems and you're going to have to work between them. Don't try and force people. It just causes chaos. It just causes wasted time. Just live with it. <laughs> the strongest will survive. So, how do we get a job going? What does all this mean? So, if you're going to so all of that stuff so far was pre even making a decision about doing a project. So an organisation will have organisational information requirements regardless of whether they're going to commission a building. They have it. It has to happen. The university has it. They'll have an asset information requirements, sometimes called an asset register. They have all that stuff because they need it to insure themselves, to operate the building, to maintain stuff. So all of that stuff's going off, but at some point they decide that they're going to commission the supply chain to deliver a new facility to them. And at that point, you get the employer's information requirements. So EIRs, that you will have heard about, are specifically for delivering a project. Okay? They're not the general requirements of an employer. They are, for this job, this client wants this asset information. Okay? And normally it will cover technical, management and commercial. So you have detail of the software platforms and levels of detail they want provided to you by them. They might say you must use Revit and I want a Revit model when you're finished. They might say you must use Bentley or Archicad. Um, there will be clear descriptions of the management processes for the project. How you're going to operate with them commercially, how you're going to work with them and when you're going to give them information. So that is your EIR. Okay? Very different from the things we talked about earlier. And the thing about EIRs is they're not static. So as the job goes on, they're constantly being updated and changed to reflect the journey of the job. So what do you do? This is my step-by-step -step guide to doing this. Made up this morning. Okay? But <laughs> not just made up, but I, I thought I would put it down because you know, we're sort of wandering through this stuff. So the first thing you need to do when you've got the client is find out how they structure their information. Because the first thing you're ever going to do is give them some information, even if it's just a letter. Right? They need to tag that up and codify it, find out how they do that. It's really good, it makes them dead happy if all their stuff comes to them in a form that they can merge into their existing system. First job. Next job is anybody who comes on that project needs to know that's what they use. The biggest problem that I see is that people do, with all the good intentions start off fantastically and then they forget to tell the next 500 people working on the job what to do and they just make their own things up and do whatever they want. So you need to make sure you tell people how this works. Then you create a zone model for your building. So for any project make a zone definition. Break it down into zones. Okay? Share those zones with everybody so that they all know what you're talking about. So if I say we're in the lecture theatre block, that zone is well understood by everybody on the project. Okay? When you've got a zone model, create a space model. Now typically an architect would start their job by being given a space brief. What space does the client need? Okay? And then they never look at it again. They never, ever look at it again. They, they do a plan and they give the client a drawing back with all the spaces on. They don't go and say, look, I did all the spaces you want. Mostly they just give them drawings. You, do, you can't do that with, with this way of working. So you have to have a space model. Those spaces have to be clearly understood by the client because they're, they're their assets that they're paying you to deliver. And you need to have a standard naming convention that everybody in the project uses force that through, okay? Because if you don't, the mechanical services engineers will make their own up, because they do, they just make them up. And you, in fact, you'll find in Revit, it's actually built into Revit to allow them to make their own up. I don't know why. Um, but you know, that causes more problems than anything where, where people, you know, you could say, for instance, there is no access to Lecture Theatre 2 on Wednesdays. And half of them don't even know where Lecture Theatre 2 is. They wander on site and they go in and, you know, you can see the problems. Just make that absolutely rigidly consistent. Spaces are what the client cares about, not the consultants. 
Consultants don't care about spaces, but clients really, really do. Then you need to set up your BIM templates for your project. And the first thing you need to do is get your classifications that the client wants to use into your BIM templates for the project. Every BIM tool is different, everyone makes it really difficult. You've got to do it though. If you don't do that at the start, putting it in afterwards is horrendous. So your whole team, whoever you're working with, has to share the classification templates for the BIM thing so they all know where stuff goes. Okay? Then list the assets that you're going to deliver. So these are the things that will be in the employer's asset information requirement document. List them out so that you know, like I showed you earlier, exactly what you're going to deliver to them. And everybody in the team needs to know about those assets. And you have to allocate responsibility for delivering the information on those assets to the people who can do it. At the moment, what's happening is it's all percolating up to the main contractor who doesn't know what to do. But it should be with the people who actually understand the information and what it means and who can check that it's correct. So you need to force it down. When you subcontract work out to people, you need to force down to them that part of their deliverable is not just putting the electrical um, wiring in, but they need to give you an identification where all the plugs and sockets are and what their numbers are. And it's their job to do that. It's not your job to go along afterwards and work out what everything is, because that's just a waste of time and effort. And you'll get it wrong. Okay? And then finally on this one, set up your BIM component libraries so that the properties they've asked you for are in your BIM component libraries. So if you're using Revit, you go into the family editor and you add the properties in there or you go into the parameters of the project and add them in for each of the asset types. But get them into your project libraries right at the start. So that even though they're blank and you don't know what they are, you know that you've not filled them in. You can see that they need to be done. Okay? This sounds horrendous, but it really isn't that much work once you've done it. And by and large, once you've done one, the next one is just tweaking it and it'll, it'll get more and more regular. But we don't do any of that at the moment. And then you need to decide how you're going to do your Kobe drops. So how are you going to give this Kobe data to your client? Some people think Kobe is just one big file. It's not. It's loads and loads of little files from different people. Okay. So you need to plan out how you're going to do that with all of your supply chain. So if I'm the main contractor, I've got specialist subcontractors, they've got subcontractors. Each of those people has got to give their one above them, the Kobe drop back, and it's got to percolate up to the top and all get put together somehow. I haven't seen anyone do that yet. Okay, but that's what, that's what they're asking us to do. So you just, you've, got to, you've got to have a plan for who delivers them and when and how you bring them all together into one place, which they sometimes call a common data environment. But that's what it's about. So the drawings and these data drops all need to come, the spreadsheets all need to come through into one place. There are three ways you can do it, okay? I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna go through them and do them, show you how, how it works. But you can, there are some BIM tools, like Archicad, and there are extensions to Revit, where you can press a button and it will produce Kobe. Um, it looks easy and everyone thinks that's great, job done. It doesn't work, not by and large they don't work. Um, some are better than others. It only works if everybody in the project's got the same BIM tool because the Kobe output that you get is different for the BIM tools. Each BIM tool does it differently. Okay? And every time well, they update the software, you've got a problem because you're working on a native BIM model, software updates, sometimes does things differently again. And we've got to bear in mind that there's UK Kobe, there's US Kobe, there's Singapore Kobe, there's Kobe from all around the world, and it's going to get worse. So it's really difficult to maintain this inside a commercial software platform that gets updated once a year, really hard. You can create Kobe from an IFC file. And this is absolutely my 100% preferred method of doing it. So basically, you, IFC is a standard, it's pretty stable, there's a new version out now, but there hasn't been one for 10 years. Um, and the nice thing is that once the tools have all put it into this standard, and they've done it reasonably correctly, 
then you can easily transfer from one standard to another standard because things are changing. So you can get Kobe out of it pretty reliably. And if things change, you can run the Kobe thing again and you can update it. It's really quite a nice way of working. Um, and it gives you more freedom for different BIM tools because all the BIM tools can produce IFC and they're certified to do that now. So, you know, it gives you a lot more freedom to federate and work collaboratively. And then here's the one for the, the hard hitters. You can edit the spreadsheet yourself. Don't even bother, you'll get it wrong. It's just horrendous. It's actually not a spreadsheet, it's a database. And it, it's, I can't do it. it. It's beyond my mind to keep all the things linked up properly. It's too difficult. But it is an option. And if it's simple, if you've only got one or two lines, you could do it. So if all you're sending back is the information about one boiler, fine. But if you've got 5,000 assets in there and you're trying to do it manually, you're dead. Okay, so how do we get COVID from IFC? Um, one of the questions I was asked by Warren, I think, was, uh, is Kobe a subset of IFC? 100% it is. It's totally a subset of IFC. Um, you'll see that IFC supports views of models, different ways of looking at them, and Kobe is the extended facility management handover view. So it's, it's well documented and well understood how it works. So that's really a plus thing. Um, the big problem is that the BIM software tools don't all write out IFC in the same way. And they don't all have the same things. So is anybody an expert on Revit? You must be. No? Have you ever seen a building in Revit? I haven't seen a building in Revit, ever. You find me somewhere in Revit where I can insert a building. There isn't one, is there? <laughs> <laughs> It's a building information modeling tool that has no building in it, right? <laughs> you can put a wall in, and it's deemed to be in something called a building, but you can't edit the building, you can't change it, okay? You think, you probably think you've seen spaces in buildings. Have you ever seen a space in 3D in Revit? <laughs> you only see it in 2D on the floor plan, okay? Because it doesn't actually have spaces in the model. It just has a 2D footprint. Okay, so it doesn't have spaces, it doesn't have zones in Revit, you can't find zones. If you look, there's no such thing like create a zone. And stories only recently got supported when someone came up with the idea that if you've got a plan, if you tick a box and say actually that's a story, we'll call that a story. And that's how you create floors in Revit. It doesn't have a floor, you can't add a floor. So you can't sit in the UI and go put a floor in here, can't do it. Okay, it's crackers and they're all pretty much similar. So just bear in mind that the BIM tools are not necessarily sitting on top of really sound building information models. They're sitting on top of really good 3D geometry engines. Okay? And that's why IFC wins all the time for me, because it is a proper building information model. And they have to tweak their tools to make it put IFC out, so they do all the fudging for you. Okay? Um, you will come across model view definitions. You've probably never heard of them, have you? So for everything in the BIM world, there is increasingly more and more model view definitions. So when I've got my BIM model, we talked about sending it to the quantity surveyor or sending it to the engineer, they want different information. They don't want everything. So the quantity surveyor just wants to know how to do the costing. The mechanical service engineer wants to know flow rates and positions. We have model view definitions that are part of the IFC standard that are strict, enforceable ways of ensuring that the right information gets through when you choose that view of the model. That's really useful. It makes things much more stable. And then we've got third party tools like we do one here called XBIM, Salibri, which will take an IFC and produce Kobe. And there's quite a few similar things to that. Just as is the best. <laughs> Sorry, that was immodest. <laughs> as is the one actually behind the BIM toolkit for the UK government, so, so it does produce the uh, PAS 1192 standard Kobe format. I'm going to pause and I'm going to go into this. This is a document. Uh, I'd like to take you through how you use Revit to produce a Kobe drop because all of that was a lot of words. When you see it, it makes sense, I think. So I'd like to just try and do that live. But before I do that, should we have a break? <laughs>